where the state of the forest industry and the forests themselves in British Columbia has deteriorated significantly in the last 20 years. A culmination of long-standing bad policies and practices. Big corporations have shut down dozens of mills, devastating workers and communities across the province. And there are many other problems. The forests are unhealthy, plagued by insect infestations, decimation of old growth trees, poor planting practices, environmental degradation, deregulation, and so on. Tremendous productive forces are being squandered and destroyed. However, despite these serious problems, forestry in BC still has great potential. There is a talented and skilled workforce with many decades of experience, as well as supportive communities and institutes of higher learning. In addition, the productive forces of BC can be brought back to health through appropriate policies and scientific practices. The modern world needs renewable BC wood, not only for lumber, but also for the thousands of potential byproducts and uses. However, there is a long-standing roadblock. The workers, indigenous peoples, foresters, contractors, scientists, and others who work in the field are alienated from having control or even having a say over the productive forces and what happens in the industry. Instead, billionaire financiers and top government bureaucrats make the key decisions too often at the expense of workers and communities. To give an example, major Canfor shareholder and billionaire Jim Pattison has re recently announced that he aims to take the company private and invest more in operations in the US rather than Canada where Canfor was established. This of course is happening at a time when Canfor is closing or curtailing mills across British Columbia. Pattison neither founded nor built Canfor, but rather is a global financier who, along with other financiers, took the coat company over some years ago, and since then has reaped huge revenue from the workforce and the forests of the province. But who actually built the company? In reality, it's been the tens of thousands of workers, contractors, and other forestry personnel who have run its diverse operations and whose labor acting on nature has created huge added value for corporate and government coffers over many years. In addition, communities in the province have provided infrastructure and services. Universities and colleges have trained foresters and scientists. Governments have provided all sorts of handouts as well as access to the rich forest resource through the granting of lucrative timber rights. Yet despite all of this, billionaire financer Pattison gets to make major decisions that nullify this tremendous contribution, and everyone else gets no say. How can it be that the revenue and profit generated from British Columbian communities is being ripped away and invested in other countries rather than being reinvested here to diversify and secure all-sided local economies? As Mackenzie Mayor, John, Joan Atkinson has put it, quote, for one individual to have that much control, I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Trees belong to the people of the province. The workforce and communities are not only alienated from having any kind of control over the forest industry, but they are also alienated from the forest resource itself. Workers work in the forests and mills, Communities are surrounded by vast forests, and community members engage in recreation and diverse other activities in the bush. Yet we have little or no say about the health of the forest, wildlife, and the environment as a whole. It's an unnatural situation. Communities should have the closest symbiotic relation with their forest, but under current arrangements, they cannot. This double alienation from the forest industry and the forest resource itself is at the heart of the problems we face today. How can this alienation be overcome? There is a deep, long-standing desire by indigenous and non-indigenous communities 
to have more say and more control over the forest industry and the forests themselves. Indeed, this is a direction we as a province need to embark on. Community control of, the, of our forests is the order of the day. The community forest concept has been a step in that direction. However, the types of community control needed are much broader and more extensive than that. Communities must be in control of the forest in their regions, including timber rights. And working people must have a say what happens to the productive forests or productive forces in the forest industry. Yes, there remains an important role for the province in environmental and other types of regulation. But control over the forest must shift from the near powerless state of communities today to one in which communities play the major role in decisions about forest planning and management and can address their specific situations. We also need legislation that requires more reinvestment by corporations in local communities and which enshrines rights for workers when these corporations decide to close operations or make other plans regarding the productive forces. To accomplish these objectives, we need a new direction for forestry and new forms and mechanisms of democratic community governance. There are various models in the world today and others that could be developed. Let's take the opportunity to discuss this new direction and this double alienation, build thriving communities and healthy forests, and get more value out of the wood. Thank you. so much. That was Peter Ewart uh, for Stand Up for the North. Um, we're going to have James Steidel say a few words next, so I'll introduce him. And as I mentioned, we'll take questions at the end. So James Steidel grew up down the Blackwater Road on a cattle ranch. He started his working life in the lumber industry where he worked at Clear Lake Sawmills and tree planted in his youth. After studying public policy and working research jobs in the legislature and labor union movement, he gravitated back to the wood industry and now operates a woodworking company, saws lumber, dabbles in project management, and collects firewood. In his spare time, he has advocated for old growth forest protection and deciduous species like aspen and birch for their value to ranching, trapping, hunting, and forest resilience is part of Stop the Spray BC and Saving Rosebud. I'd like to welcome James Steidel. Thanks, thanks for having me. Wonderful speech, Peter. Um, I'll probably touch on a lot of the same things you did, so forgive me if, you, uh, uh, if I repeat uh, the points already raised. <clears throat> so I think it feels pretty hopeless a lot of times um, in these faces of exploitation to, to feel like we have any chance to kind of stand up to it. Um, but I think, I think we do have hope and I think we can't give up and I think there's a way forward. Uh, so we were witnessing the end of an era in Prince George as I kind of grew up in it. Uh, for the past 70 years we've been a lumber town and I think we're kind of on the way out from this. Um, wood's getting further and further away and more expensive to mill economically and environmentally. So I think this trajectory has veered away from sort of a path that could be considered sustainable years ago. And there's been a couple of milestones on that path that I want to talk about. <clears throat> and I guess the biggest one is, is the rise of the super mills. So as, as uh, Michelle mentioned in the introduction, I grew up down the Blackwater Road and my dad worked at Clear Lake. And that was actually a wonderful little community down there. There's a trailer park. Uh, there's about 50 to 100 people live there and all my best friends and I grew up lived there and I'd, I'd get off the school bus and my dad would get off work and we'd go further out to the bush where I lived near Punchell Lake. And uh, you know, they had a commissary there, there was like an ambulance station and everybody knew everybody's name, a lot of the people worked at the mill. <clears throat> and it was actually a really, really wonderful place. Um, so I, I got a job there of course when I, when I was turned about 15 and, and I did all sorts of jobs there. Um, piled lumber on the green chain, fed and tailed the edgers, and all sorts of different stuff. And Clear Lake had the distinction of being one of the most inefficient mills in BC. So every single 
piece of wood that went through that mill was touched by a human hand at least a couple times. Um, it only produced about 120,000 board feet of lumber a shift, and there were 60 guys that worked there between the planer and the sawmill. So I just want you to remember those numbers that I just told you. But even though it was really inefficient, it made money all the way up until the bitter end. When it closed down and the, and the trailer park was kind of uh, shuttered, people who had lived there their whole lives were evicted unwillingly. There were holdouts, but that didn't matter. The place hired too many humans and it needed to be shut down. That was about back in 2011. I don't know if you guys remember that. <clears throat> Every piece of equipment that had been ingeniously developed in house, all simple yet effective, was destroyed and sold for scrap. None of the equipment was allowed to be used by another company for sawmilling. See, that would help the competition, and we can't, we can't do that. It was all destroyed. Uh, when, when all that stuff was sold, the mill site itself, when it was sold, it was stipulated that you could never operate a sawmill at that location ever again. You couldn't even use it to produce non-competitive lumber products like aspen or birch products using the equipment. Um, so I think, you know, these kind of activities by these big companies where they're not really looking out for um, adding value to products or even things that weren't even in competition with their main product, I think is really telling and unfortunate. And I kind of believe they lost a little bit of their social license through doing that. So when they closed Pier Lake, a lot of the production was shifted up to Bear Lake. I don't know if you guys know much about the Bear Lake sawmill, but it's a monster. Um, <clears throat> It's an incredible super mill. It pumps out about 10 times the amount of wood as Clear Lake ever did. So it's 1.2 million board feet a shift. Uh, inside, I'm told the machinery is so impressive as to seem unreal. They have double-edged bandsaw blades that are 60 feet long. They can, they can cut through a 30-inch tree that's 300 years old like nothing. Um, even more impressive, I'm told, because I've never been in there and I don't give people tours, is the absence of humans. So even though the mill produces 10 times the amount of wood as Clear Lake, it hires less than half the workforce. So if you say you needed one logging truck of wood to hire a guy for maybe a month, Polar, you need 20, lo 20 logging truck loads to hire the same guy or girl. So, and this is probably conservative. <clears throat> so the amount of wood that's harvested to keep these jobs in the lumber industry alive has just risen exponentially not only in mills, but also in the logging shows. And I think logging truck drivers have been the only constant, although ownership of logging trucks has shifted from independence to being owned by these big logging truck companies. So I think here in, is, lies one of the big milestones that we witnessed in Prince George that Peter alluded to over the last 20 years, and that's this rampant automation of our mills that has disconnected industry profits from our communities. So we've lost 45,000 forestry jobs in the past 15 years in this province. The employees of Clear Lake were some of those jobs. And yet despite these jobs, the clear cuts keep getting bigger, the moose keep getting spare, and the forest company profits keep getting bigger. So something's seriously wrong with all this. <clears throat> so these so-called local forest companies, as Peter alluded to, have turned around and invested all the billions of dollars that they've earned in offshore milling capacity. <clears throat> and they aren't just investing in value-added production, sorry, they aren't investing in value-added production here in Prince George to make use of aspen and birch. It was cheaper just to spray it. They aren't investing in our new lumber products like cross laminate beams or engineered trusses. <clears throat> they aren't investing in selective logging to save the good trees instead of just cutting everything down and burning all the little guys that they can use. And you can bet your bottom dollar they aren't investing in keeping these mills running through downtimes unlike, say, for instance, Dunkley or some of the smaller carrier, or some of the smaller family-owned mills, which do keep their employees employed and don't use these scare tactics of shutdowns when they don't think they're earning as much money as they think they deserve. So back, back when I grew up in Prince George, we had the most millionaires per capita in Canada. Um, I don't know if you guys remember that, we also had the highest income per capita in Canada <clears throat> for a few censuses. Mill ownership was decentralized, and we had tens of mills. They all competed with each other, and the public got the most bang for their buck. We no longer have this competitive marketplace. We know this is true because companies are making billions of dollars in profit off of two-by-fours. Not iPhones or some ingenious invention that they deserve to be paid for. They're making two-by-fours from our publicly owned logs. 
In fact, the only ingenuity that they've shown is their ability to replace humans with machines and basically replace local PG residents and jobs with robots and automation. So when we hear news about, you know, we need to keep logging for all these jobs and we need to punch roads up the Anzac River, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but this is, this is going to be happening pretty soon. This is beautiful forest in the Anzac River and they're putting a bridge up there to access this entire valley. So when they tell you how to do this for jobs, <clears throat> I think we have to be really aware of this. Um, if they truly care about jobs, we would never let the monster of automation come and take them all. We would have maintained small mills like Clear Lake, whose cut levels were more in line with nature. If we had small mills producing a 1.2 million board feet a shift that Canfor does every shift, uh, we'd have 600 people working, not 30. So it's not about the jobs. This rampant liquidation of our forests, the spring that goes along with it, the vulnerable monoculture plantations we're replacing them with, these aren't for our benefit. Uh, this is for this massive, unaccountable, vacuous parasite, for lack of a better word, of global capitalism that we need to address somehow. And back to my introductory line there, it's gonna, it feels hopeless, but I think there's, there's ways we can do this. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned in the introduction that I, I like to collect firewood. This is one good example. Like, to, to get firewood, you can't do it. In, in Prince George, to do commercial firewood, you have to take your, lot, your truck, your pickup truck full of firewood across this commercial scale and get it scaled. If you have tenure. Like I've, I've tried to do it. You know, you, it's like a huge process to get a permit to sell commercial firewood. So, of course, nobody ever does. And it's, it's tough. Okay, so I make cutting boards. I do woodworking. I want to get some cedar. I, I have a little sawmill, I have a little wood miser, I can't buy cedar from anywhere. Like, it, 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 you go to Dome Creek right now, there's huge piles full of cedar that I could use that's gonna get burnt, and I can't, I'm not allowed to get it. So, these are all the crazy things that <clears throat> have been set up to benefit these massive companies, and just like how they shut down Clear Lake and scrapped all the equipment, they don't want anybody like me or you or anybody else to get in on the game. Because it's a real good game for these guys who are making billions of dollars and they don't want it to change. So we've got to try to stop that. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was James Steidel. Um, Peter Ewart is a, is a public speaker and James just did a TED talk on the weekend. So they're both going to be really hard acts for me to follow here. But I'm going to do my best. So um, there was a time lapse video. It's popped up on on the video on the screen to my left here. And in green, it shows the area that we refer to as the Northern Web Belt. So you've probably been to the Web Belt. And you might know some of the areas in it by their names. So the Anzac, the Haminka, the Upper Fraser, the Ancient Forest. They're all part of this broad area we call the Northern Web Belt. The forests of the wet belt naturally get centuries old and sometimes older because they don't get fires like the ones we see in other parts of BC, as most of you here would know. We still have primary and old growth forests in this area, and primary forests are forests that have never been industrially harvested before. However, as both Peter and James have mentioned, we have had about 50 years of industrial harvesting here. And, and what we are left with are a few intact valleys and pockets of primary forest that still support wildlife and fish. I have personally been told by people in industry and in government that the plan is to log all the remaining merchantable old growth out of our region. Right now, companies are rapidly harvesting the areas and the volumes of trees they currently have the right to access. And nowhere is this more obvious than in the Anzac, north of Prince George and the Fraser Flats area, for example, east of Prince George in the inland rainforest. After companies finish off the areas they currently have the right to access, they will go after the areas that have some form of weak protection, like old growth management areas, for example. And after that, they'll probably try for the places that they used to consider too expensive or difficult to access. So if we don't stop it, 
That's what's gonna happen. About a month ago, um, Jen Matthews and I went to the invite only meeting for interior forestry renewal. Um, we were told it was gonna be just stakeholders and it actually wasn't just stakeholders, but they definitely knew who they were excluding from the meeting. And we heard licensee representatives ask the province to provide, quote, incentives to access difficult terrain and also to grant them permission to log in parks. And disturbingly, provincial government staff actually seemed to entertain those ideas. A few weeks ago, the Council of Forest Industries, or COFI for short, which represents the major forestry licensees, released a report saying that they want the BC government to create a working forest zone that would essentially guarantee that industrial logging can take place there and that there cannot be, for example, protection of caribou habitat or other conservation measures in that area at all. So now the companies are running out of old growth to take, which is their own doing. They want to make sure that there is a system in place to guarantee them the rest of it. They've asked for a, quote, locked-in commitment that the remaining old growth forests will be available to them without challenges from people like you and I. And we are not having it. As everyone here knows, old forests have values that go beyond just logs. I think we should all be concerned that any group of private interests feels that entitled to our public lands in that way, especially when you look at what they've done with the privilege so far. I got a really big shock about a month ago when I was watching a video of the UBC Dean of Forestry speak at a conference in the spring. Um, I went to, I did my part of my schooling down there. Um, I almost spilled my drink hearing the head of one of Canada's biggest forestry schools say this. In the video, he said that we should be doing better with forests that we've already converted so that we don't need to go into the remaining old growth and primary forests. We support this statement 100%, and I never thought I would agree with the Dean of Forestry at UBC. Um, and this is the message that we want decision makers to hear loud and clear. The Dean of Forestry added that we have an unsustainable economy and that we ought to be changing the way we live and the way we do things. There is a bigger picture here in Prince George that we should be thinking about too. And I don't think we're gonna hear about the bigger picture from those who have a vested interest in making sure that nothing changes. For example, I think producing food should be a bigger part of our local economy. And that's not a possibility you might hear about from the people who currently hold the balance of power. The bottom line is that we will never get our natural old growth forest back after it's been logged, even an hour or a children's lifetimes. Trees are renewable, they grow back, but old growth forest is not renewable and it's not replaceable in any way, shape, or form. The forests we log now are not returning, and that's for a number of reasons. Conservation North has been advocating for more protection of our remaining primary forests in the Northern Wet Belt. We support forestry in areas already converted to managed forest, and we do not want our last forests, old growth forests, to be turned into plantations. We believe that there can be a robust local economy within those reasonable limits. We go into more detail um, in, in our recommendations document, which we have copies of here, and which Jen Matthews is gonna speak about um, after we take questions but I would like to invite Peter and James back up, and I was thinking that um, perhaps we could answer any questions the audience might have, or if any of you have a really thoughtful comment you want to say to the group, um, you can come up to the microphone and say it. Um, yeah. Anybody have any questions? So, I think, I think, um, I think if, if these primary forests are replaceable, I, I think, I think uh, that I would probably, it's probably not really wrong because, because like that, I think, 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 I think,
your darn rights. <laughs> well, we've got other problems other than just forestry, so air pollution and right. I, th I think I understood um, that he thinks that air pollution and there's other bigger issues or other issues that that are that we should be worried about. There's lots of stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Good Hello. morning. So, one thing that you forgot to mention in Nanta is full of spruce trees. Sorry, do you want to come up with us? <clears throat> no, I want to come up. Full. Oh, I feel good better back here. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we need to deal with this. But the question is, is why did we let that go for 20 years before we did it? Right, so um, thank you for that comment about the spruce beetle and the Anzac. Um, so I would like to address that for a second. Um, my background's in disturbance ecology, and um, in particular insect disturbances. And, and one of the things we know from doing 100 years of research on insect disturbances is that there is no way to control an insect or a, a beetle outbreak once it starts. There's no way to do it. There's no scientific evidence you can control it. In that part of the wet belt, spruce beetle is normal and natural. And it might be going through outbreaks that are larger and more extreme than in the past because of climate change, but we can't actually um, control spruce beetle outbreaks, I'm afraid. That and um, one, of the, one of the things about disturbances like beetle outbreaks is that um, even after they go through an area, the structure of the forest remains. Um, so from our position as an organization, uh, we recognize that there's some salvage logging that happens, um, but a spruce beetle epidemic is, is not an excuse to do what they've done in the ANZAC that we've seen. I agree with what, what Michelle is saying. There was one thing that could have been controlled during this period of time was the uh, harvesting of green wood that took place on a massive scale. Uh, that, uh, that's something that uh, the government uh, could have been involved in, 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 in through regulations and, and so on, through the Forest Service or whatever, but uh, it was quite flagrant. Everybody knew about it, you know, and you just had to follow a uh, logging truck down the road and you could see uh, which of the logs were beetle killed logs and which ones were green timber that should have been uh, still in place for the midterm supply. Michelle, can you comment on that? The genetics of the there, there's a little patch of crown land where I get firewood, and it, uh, I think just like Peter said, that um, had about 50% of the trees were pine beetle killed. And I went in there by hand and got all the firewood out. You know, I just get six, six, eight foot chunks, and I could carry it by hand. And I, I cleaned out this whole area, and you wouldn't even tell that that uh, somebody'd been in there. I got probably like 10 trucks, 10 fire, 10 pickup trucks of firewood out of there. It was incredible, out of like a little like one hectare area, and all the all the trees are still there. You can't even tell that uh, that somebody did anything in here. Um, Jen just reminded me to make a point. Um, there's a researcher in the states, and she's getting a bit more public attention now. Her name is Diana Six. She's from the University of Montana, and she was she wrote a paper recently about how it's really important to leave the surviving trees after a beetle outbreak goes through because those trees basically contain the key to future forests. If they survive something like a beetle outbreak, and what we've seen happen, as Peter mentioned, is that um, there is just, um, you know, really violent logging of green forests. And so the trees that would have survived are now gone. And so that's why that's a really bad management decision. So I'm a retired forester that was with the Ministry of Forests. Um, I've flown the district. Um, I did the spreadsheet that tracked spruce beetle, um, not recently, but in like four years ago. And the volume weighted spruce beetle was like 0.1% volume weighted on spruce. Yeah, the hominca is all red and spruce beetle. Bills Creek, all red and spruce beetle, but a lot of places aren't. What? Why were they logging out down the too much? We flew over that. There was not, a, didn't see any red. Like there was a hell of a lot of non-attack timber that's been logged. That's our midterm that we, the government and industry, took. 
and, and, the, and the Professional Foresters Association, hey, it's all good. I'm really angry. Are there any other questions? Well, I got a comment about uh, hauling some beetle infested trees across all, halfway across the province and spreading the beetles. They're supposed to be controlling the infestation, and they're loading it up on trucks where the infestation is, and dragging it halfway across the province to a mill that is two, three, four hundred kilometers away. It's spreading the disease rather than containing it. They're supposed to limit the transportation of beetles at very low temperatures and the beetles would survive when they fell fall off. They all agreed to it and during the summer when it's the most critical time that you're not supposed to be transporting the infested trees, they were doing it anyway. So it would appear that even when you give permission to log it so that they could control it, they're still not following their own protocol and they're hauling it in the summertime and spreading the disease. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Um, I think there was another question in the back here. Um, uh, as a forager, uh, it's important to me to have diversity in forests. Right? What I see, you know, even with the forests that were logged in the 40s, is that so you planted these spruce, fir uh, forests, subalpine fir forests, with pine. Yep. So you see these uh, supposedly uh, uh, diverse forests that they, uh, if you talk to a lot of government officials, will say, it's still a forest. But when you look at the understory of these forests, it's dead. Because all of the biodiversity that depends upon the different species of trees is all gone. And now all you have is just dead, dead under, understory. So my, that's a concern of mine, and obviously something that hasn't been addressed even to now. How can we affect change to change those very important parts of, of uh, the forest industry that are destroying the future of our forest areas? How, how can we affect change? What exactly is it that we can do? So, so one of my other projects is Stop the Spray BC. Um, and uh, to your point, there's a place uh, right by the Anzac River, right on the other side of the bridge, that uh, was logged recently, five years ago. And they sprayed, it's probably like 100 meters from the, the river. They planted 100% spruce in there. I went and looked at all the stumps, and half of them were subalpine fir. Subalpine fir is, has way more biodiversity value than spruce trees, right? Moose eat it whole bunch more birds like it. It's got different properties in the soil. So they planted that to 100% spruce and then they sprayed it, like right next to the river. It's absolutely disgusting. And, um, you know, any kind of broadleaf that would grow up there that could maybe support some other kind of species underneath, they're all gone. It's just gonna be one type of tree. It's, it's plantation forestry is what it is. And it's, it's um, I kind of brought this up with the federal guys because it, in a lot of many senses, it originated with a federal forest policy back in the 80s to basically grow conifer plantations all across Canada, and they provided all sorts of research dollars for this, and that's what modern forestry is, right? So if you go south of town, that they sprayed the hell out of south down to Blackwater, <clears throat> it's all pine trees. That wasn't all pine trees when it was logged. It was probably half spruce. There was Douglas fir in there. There's aspen. There's birch. I planted those places back in the late 90s. We didn't only plant pine, we planted 30% spruce. And that's what they'll tell you. We're not only planting pine, we're putting spruce in there too. And fir. But it's all dead. So why, why didn't the spruce survive? Now you look at the places that they didn't spray, where the aspen's growing, the spruce is underneath the aspen. Right? Because, and this is things that, I don't know, they've never thought about or they've never studied that area. So every area in, in the province is totally different, right? So down the Blackwater, it turns out, in my experience, what I've seen, if you let the aspen grow, you get spruce coming up underneath there, you get the Douglas fir coming up, and when you eliminate the aspen, because the aspen's the only thing that can compete with the pine, then you've eliminated all those other coniferous uh, species in your forest. So that's, that's one thing that we can do is, is try to get these stocking standards changed, let more broadleaf happen in our forests, um, and uh, make our forest basically less of this plantation style 
thing on these on our regenerating forests and let nature take its course again. And there's tons of reasons why we should be doing that, not only for diversity, but also cattle ranching. Like aspen forests and broadleaf, they support exponentially more moose forage, they support exponentially more cattle, birds, all sorts of shit. Sorry, excuse the language, but um, that's, that's one thing we can do. We've got a petition on there in case you're not familiar with that. Um, we've got a website, Stop the Spray BC, and it kind of ties into this whole, how do we manage the stuff that we've already logged so that that stuff can be as healthy and as productive as possible, and I think that's another platform that we need to address with all this. Thanks. Well, as James was just relating, the knowledge is out there to solve all kinds of problems. The, the local people who work here and have worked here for decades and so on, and uh, who live in the forest and so on, there's all of this knowledge. We have university, etc. But we don't have the democratic mechanisms to actually make the, make the decisions. So as a result, someone somewhere decides that we're going to have, uh, as James points out, uh, glyphosate, the helicopter sprayed all over the place. You know, and those decisions are made and, and here we are standing on the ground with no, no say. So we have, to, like, when we look at the whole question of forestry and we look at the question of environment, it's very much tied up with the whole issue of democratic rights and expanding democratic rights. Uh, because the current democratic process falls short in so many ways. Thank you, and one thing I would like to add to that is to remind everybody that Conservation North's position is that we need to keep natural forests natural and concentrate industrial activity on the areas that have already been impacted by um, industrial forestry in the past. I'm not at all familiar with the forest industry except I Are you still alive and well, or do you know? Do you know what I mean with that? Because you're in the small community forest, and you cry, and you hear, you hear the words, but I don't know. Are they still around? Or? Yes, they are still around. They're, uh, I'm not sure. What, it's around 55 or 60 in the province. Um, the thing with them, though, is that they tend to be fairly small. You know, and I, I think what I, what. Uh, I'm concerned about is making it so that <laughs> it's everywhere, right? You know, like you, you expand the community concept, but uh, the community forests are, are thriving. They go back a long ways in British Columbia. You know, like even places like like Mission, uh, BC, and and elsewhere uh, have that experience. I might add that um, the the move towards community control over the forest. Uh, there, there are uh, concepts in, right here in North America and right here in British Columbia, for example, the forest trust concept and so on, uh, put forth by Andrew Mitchell and, and, and others. As well, other parts of the world like Nepal and Sri Lanka and, and Mexico, uh, they also have their own experience there with uh, developing community control of the forest. And I think that's a really exciting area that we have to look into in, in terms of addressing the problems we face. Yep. Uh, on the idea of community forests, one of the worst decisions that our politicians made quite some time ago, now I'm old enough to know, uh, was taking away the fact that a mill the timber supply was tied to the mill. Once that was gone, then the trucks started going halfway across the province and they're pulling wood from Mackenzie and shipping it to the canal and crisscrossing and trucks driving past each other on the highway, all with the same wood. Yeah. That's the kind of community forest that you really need is bring it back so the timber supply is tied to the mill, not that you can just take it from any damn place. As long as you can get it on a truck and get it there, it's yours. Uh, we've got to get it back so the people that have the forest, they're the ones that you give it crap about it when it's yours. When you don't see it, you don't. Yeah, to, to tying, tying the forest to the mills in that way was an important part of province building. It's one of the reasons why you had all the communities able to develop in the interior because they brought in that, that, that policy. 
unfortunately, it was taken away back in uh, you know the early part when the when the Liberals came to power. They eliminated that, and uh, that's very unfortunate because uh, it, that, that that's an aspect of of uh, policies that, uh, that that was needed definitely. That, that was the going of the Super Bowl. That's it. That's the when I when I tell you about the fees act process you can participate in. That is the exact kind of idea that you can put into these forms that the government would like us to tell the work their ideas. So tell them that you would like a parents back where the logging is tied to the local mill. So you can you can do those types of ideas, and I'll tell you more about that later. But if that's something you're interested in, keep that idea and uh, put it into the to the forms. I'm just talking to myself. Um, it's not the position of uh, Conservation North, whatever, but um, you know we need more local control up here of our of our forests. A lot of these decisions are being made down in Victoria yeah. with people in an office building, you know, a ten-story office building there on, on Wharf Street, and we have a district forester who has an incredible amount of power, but he's accountable to Victoria, right? They're the ones that hire and fire our district forester. We don't get to do that. We don't get to hold our district forester accountable or provide any kind of direction to our district forester how we want to see our forest managed. It's not our ability to do that. I think that needs to change. Any other questions? Um, Can I make a comment? Yeah, loud. <laughs> <laughs> or, or use the mic. I think a lot of us that care about nature, we, we started in forestry because that was your excuse to get outside. And, you know, at the time it seemed like it was endless, you know? Your father was a forester, your kids will be them too. And I went, to, I went down and I, you know, I got a degree in forestry from UBC and, you know, the whole time they told us that we can manage nature really well. That we can get everyone a job, make a pile of money, and you can still have songbirds. That you can still catch bull trout. That your neighbor can still hunt moose. That your friends will own trap lines and they'll be productive. And I think we all know now that was an effing lie. And we're, we're getting to a point now where there's, there are limits not just to how well we can sustain nature so that we can enjoy the many things that we took for granted. But nature's bleeding out right now. And I think we need to actually start thinking about how much needs to be left so that there's even a chance for a rebound in songbirds because we lost them here in central BC. I'd love for an idea that my kids could see Fisher because they're gone. And I open the regs because I want to fish and I'm told I can't keep a bull trout. Yeah. So you have, you have another question? I did. Uh, we're on the traditional territory of the Clay Lake name and I wondered uh, as an organization uh, has, has there been a lot of dialogue with Chief, Chief and Council about their position on biodiversity, about old growth, about caribou habitat? Uh, I'm not. Um, yes, we have had conversations with them, and I'm probably not at liberty to really discuss the contents of them. I, I think they are really concerned about what's happening here, but I can't really speak for them. But yeah, as an organization, we do have ties with the Clayley tonight, and we do speak with them regularly about what we're up to. Uh, the McLeod Lake Band, this summer, they put out a letter opposing all herbicide spraying, fertilizing, and chemicals in their traditional territory. And I'm led to believe I haven't seen it, but uh, late, late today did the same thing. Yeah, there's a but with that. Yeah. The cloud lakes can also log an enormous, like, seen from space kind of block on their traditional territory. East of the highway there? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And what you see from the highway is not even a touch. 
Yeah, it goes over the hills and over the hills and over the hills. And it's old Burl's Douglas fir, right? Correct? Uh, there's a good there's a good bunch of nice Douglas fir in there. Not all the way to the whole being turned into a house. Okay, gentle. Yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, oh, one more question back here. Yeah, I'm not really uh, a plot and fan of spring, but these plantations need to be virtually free. They're not going to survive. We'll be 30 years down the road, and we'll have some trees that grew up and the brush them will be bent over. Yeah, no way. So you do need to brush the trees, and you need to find a reason to do that. Have you ever dipped me down the Blackwater, say around Punchell Lake? I did that. Okay, so they've logged those places, like right, the 24 kilometer, great example. They logged in there back in the 70s. They never even planted that place. They never sprayed it, they never brushed it. That forest is awesome. There's loads of examples down there that never even touched. And if you've got aspen coming in there, you've got spruce coming in there, you've got pine coming in there, they're beautiful forests. You don't need... They plant it, they get up this high, fire weeds this high, we call it smoke. <clears throat> You go up there and look at them, they come up like this, they roll off, eight inches above the ground, and they roll along the ground. You need to brush your trees. You need, you need biodiversity in your forest, you need trees that don't burn and leaf out, the aspens, the cottonwoods, the birches. Well, you need these, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you need those trees out there. And what they're spraying, like, 90% of what they're spraying is aspen. Okay, they're spraying a tree that's worth 100 bucks a cubic meter up in Fort St. John, which is the same price as for pine. Okay, so, and, and here locally, they're 50 bucks a cubic meter. Okay, for you guys, how about you guys have a discussion about this after? So, um, Thank you for all your questions, and I'll let uh, Jen Matthews say a few words about our um, the second objective for tonight, which is to get you guys to provide feedback to the interior forestry renewal um, process. Um, yeah, Jen, take it away. All right, great. Okay, so just to let you know what's um, happening with this, our government decided, hey, forestry sucks in the interior. Everybody's losing their jobs, and there's just clear cuts everywhere. There's no wood, fires, blah, 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 blah. So let's have a renewal process. We'll get everybody's great ideas. We'll write a document that says, this is what we heard, and then we'll tell everybody what to do. And industry gets three chances at giving their feedback in this process. They got a personal invite to, to say, um, hey, all you big mills, and all you big companies with all your 10-year ten, ten agreements, I want you to partner up with your local municipalities and tell us what you want us to do. And then we're going to tour the interior of BC and we're going to invite all the same people back to our little private meetings, no researchers, no environmental groups, unless you just happen to luck out and find out when the meeting is and then bully your way in, and certainly nobody from the community. But you have your one chance, and that's to fill out this form on the internet. And the deadline is tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern Pacific Standard Time. So you gotta do it tonight. And um, if you don't know what to say, we've uh, got some prompts. <laughs> They're on a PDF right on the laptop, so you can, or paper. You can copy and paste it, put in your own ideas, put in things that you heard tonight that are interesting to you, and don't feel limited by their stupid prompts because maybe you don't have anything to say about climate change and forest carbon, but maybe you have something to say about hunting or foraging or biodiversity. Put it in there. Who cares what the label is because they're going to read it and put it in their What We Heard document and then at least it's on paper somewhere in Victoria. So don't feel limited by their prompts. Put what is important to you. Put your creative ideas down and um, do it today. Don't leave here without one of these. This, yeah. These are our ideas. And <laughs> one of these, which is the website where you can fill out this form, your one chance to give your opinion on how our forest should be managed. And one of these, which is our take action letter. And it's editable, so you can change it to say whatever you want add your own ideas in, and hopefully take some of our asks that we think are really great. They're really simple, and we just want to hold on to these last few green spaces that hold old primary forests before they're gone, because they are not part of the renewable forest. And you can see in our time-lapse video, which is going to come up here, you can see there's not a hell of a lot left. We're asking for a tiny sliver of protect, protect, protection. So um, please use our laptops. It's 
super easy and also like have more conversations with each other, uh, talk about what your ideas are, come talk to us, come talk to others. There's lots of experts in this room. Um, meet a new friend and uh, have some fun. Thanks and thank you very much for coming.